Welcome everybody to How WebOps Moves Your Mission Forward. Uh, we are going to talk today about the relationship of websites and web operations to your institution's mission. I suspect today if you have clicked view on this webinar, we are probably preaching to the choir. You are likely extremely familiar with just how important it is to have a functional, credible web operations uh, and functioning website uh, in order to help your institution meet its organizational goals. Um, but a couple of things we're gonna focus on today that we think will be of particular value for you um, are some concrete steps that you can take to make improvements in your web ops that will help you get your work done. Um, and also some, uh, some ways of explaining this work to your leadership to help make sure you have the right support, the right resources uh, and the right investments uh, to get you where you need to be. So uh, if you'll move us along a slide. Let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Cheney Kurunyotis. I am a senior solutions consultant at, at FFW, which is a digital agency that has worked with quite a few universities as well as um, businesses and other spaces to help uh, create new and better performing websites. For the purposes of this webinar, it's probably also particularly relevant that I used to work in marketing and communications at both UC Berkeley and Stanford. So the issues related to uh, digital communications and websites in higher ed uh, is truly near and dear to my heart. So you'll hear a few stories along the way today um, and some examples of strategies that we've used in the past that have really worked um, to help, uh, help use our digital technologies to, to move our missions forward. Um, and let me take a minute here to uh, let my colleague John introduce himself as well. Hello, I'm John Richards. I'm a developer advocate at Pantheon. Uh, there, I specialize on training teams on implementing website operation best practices. Uh, but before I was at Pantheon, I spent about seven years at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, where I started in a role as a developer in public affairs and eventually ended up as director of digital communications um, and learned a ton about uh, higher education and, and how it works there. So hopefully uh, you can learn from some of the mistakes I made along the way so you don't replicate those. Great, so let's start by thinking a little bit about what the, the primary thing is that you wish your site could do right now, but it doesn't. If you're anything like me, you probably thought of the answer to that question before I finished asking it. Certainly from my own experience working with university and institutional websites in years past, um, I often wished for such crazy things as being able to update content in less than an hour without breaking anything on the site, uh, being able to uh, rely on the site to stay live 24-7, um, being able to filter and sort faculty publications by the different filters that were relevant for them, um, or even perhaps dreaming of a site that looked like it was designed in this millennium rather than the last one. So. We all sort of know the, the, the pain and, and difficulty of working with a, a site that just doesn't quite meet your needs, right? Um, IT and, and web ops is already kind of a painful subject for a lot of university teams. You're under-resourced, you're overwhelmed, your staff is often spending a lot of time working on, you know, sort of repetitive tasks or minutia that just make it really difficult for you to move forward with the crucial work of supporting the institution. Right. You didn't join a university um, or an educational institution so that you could spend all of your time making tedious copy updates or trying to keep your site from collapsing. You're there to support the educational and scholarly mission. And a site that doesn't function that way, it means the site is not working for you, you're working for it. So if you'll move us forward a slide, this is also an opportunity for us to think just for a minute about whether you might have experienced anything in the past year that has exacerbated this problem to the nth degree, right? Just at a time when suddenly you need your site to perform better than it ever has before. It needs to support new and different types of functions, perhaps remote learning. Uh, it needs to be able to update content about what's going on on campus at an incredibly timely fashion, if not in exactly in real time. Um, it needs to fulfill all sorts of new communicative functions that perhaps uh, it wasn't doing before right at the same time when perhaps your resources have been cut drastically. So we know everybody has sort of had a, a really painful experience 
with what happens when you under-resource your communications infrastructure. And so this is gonna be kind of a key theme that we refer to over the course of our, of our talk today um, in thinking about not just the frustrations of a site that, that limps along maybe fine in, in good times, but what happens when you have a catastrophic failure. So before we go into a little bit more detail about what some of these challenges are um, and how we can kind of break them down and solve them, I wanna make sure we're all talking uh, about the same thing. So when we talk about web ops, we're not talking about a person, we're not talking about a product, we're not talking about a department, we're talking really about a set of practices, right? That enable you to maintain your digital presence in a way that is reliable, it is stable, it is functional, and ideally it does not drain the life out of you um, and you know suck every remaining suck your, your will to live away while you're trying to keep it moving. So we're talking a lot about a few different ways to tackle some of the common problems that university departments face in web operations. So you'll see some technology discussions, but you also see us talk about practices that your team might adopt, um, strategies for uh, improving productivity, automation, workflows, et cetera, et cetera. So web ops is sort of this universe uh, of how you, how you get your site working for you. So there are several reasons why this matters for your institution. And again, as I said at the top, we're kind of preaching to the choir here, but um, certainly um, every one of you has had the experience of trying to speak to your leadership about why these investments of time or resources are important now. Um, we argue that now is a particularly critical time to invest in this resource as central to your institutional mission. Um, and there are a few reasons that kind of spring to the top of our minds um, when we think about why this is relevant in 2021, right? The first thing, of course, again, top of mind, reliable crisis response, right? We have all learned very painfully this year that communications infrastructure that is not properly resourced are not sufficient in a time of significant crisis. The institutions that survive this crisis are not gonna be forgiven for making that mistake again. So you now know that you need resilient communications infrastructure um, in order to be prepared for whatever's coming next. Um, a second reason we think this is really mission critical now is you know, even before the pandemic, there was already a really, really strong tend, uh, trend to, to move towards digital for information gathering, for connecting with other members of the community, even for learning, you know, of course the, the pandemic sort of accelerated that. And, and certainly um, as things we hope start to get more back to normal, there will be some movement back. Of course, you know, we hope that education will resume being face-to-face, -face, scholarly collaboration will still be face-to-face. -face. Um, but there are in many ways, a lot of conveniences in terms of easy access to information that's up to date. Um, that members of your community are gonna expect going forward, no matter what. So people are still at this point, always gonna be able to expect that they can get their groceries delivered from Amazon to their house um, without having to put on pants and go to the grocery store, right? Yeah, I'm sure you can think of the, the educational equivalent of that. Perhaps your students wanna know whether classes are happening online or in person in the next semester and they expect that information to be up to date and at their fingertips. Um, and that's not gonna change even, even when we get the pandemic under control. And then the third thing um, that we think makes this critically important right now, you know, there aren't too many audiences um, in the tech world where we could, I think, plausibly talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and have it resonate with folks, but we figured this would probably be a good audience for that. Um, you know, in order for you to be able to use your site to support the things they talk about in the view book, you have to have those foundations built first, right? You, your, your site needs to be stable, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be functional, and then you can climb up atop the pyramid past the website equivalent of food and shelter and get into your self-actualization, right? Your ability to drive impact for your institution. So, Let's move ahead a slide. I can talk a little bit about what that might look like for your organization, right? So depending on what part of the institution you're, you're involved with, um, you know, supporting impact, reaching the peak of that pyramid might look a little bit different, right? There are a lot of different ways um, that your site might, might support the university mission. Maybe you are trying to bring community members together to connect students with 
alumni and faculty or other students. Perhaps you're trying to better integrate with social media to support your institution's presence uh, in, on a broader scale. Perhaps you need to do more work to support giving and fundraising. There are a lot of different ways in which your site very directly, and we can draw a really clear bright line between the proper operation of your site and supporting your university's fundamental mission. So if you go ahead onto the next slide, this, these are the things that we hope, uh, you know, a properly built and resourced university website ought to be able to do, right? So the, the, top, the top of the pyramid, the, the top of the hierarchy of need is driving impact for your institution. Um, and that really sort of falls into a few different categories, regardless of what those specifics might be, right? You need to be able to support education. You need to be able to support and share the scholarly research that happens at your institution, right? You need to be able to provide information about the school. You need to be able to help grow engagement among all of your different audiences. And you need to be able to support giving, right? It's a critical part of every institution. So websites that create and drive impact are websites that can carry out some combination of these activities. However, sadly, <laughs> it's not so easy to get your site to this point. Um, in many cases, we find ourselves working uh, at sort of the, the bottom or the middle rungs um, of, the, of the hierarchy where we're sort of struggling to ensure that the site is stable and functional, right? So instead of thinking, how can I drive impact for my institution, we're thinking, if I update this content, is it gonna break something? Um, or why is it taking three days to get this change made? Um, my, my dean wanted it up yesterday. All of these sorts of things, so many of us are stuck um, in these sort of lower tiers of the pyramid um, and we're not able to do the type of impactful work that we really want to be able to do for our organization. So if we move ahead a slide, what would it actually look like um, if we were able to, to work our way up the pyramid um, and get ourselves to the point where we're ready to create impact. Um, looking at this pyramid as a way for you to gauge kind of where you and your institution are with your site. So if you've achieved the base level, what, I'm, what I've got here is as functionality. That means you have reliable technology, reasonably good user experience. So it's not too difficult for people to go on your site and find what they're looking for. Um, the site is secure, it's not vulnerable to hacking, and you can update content without worrying that anything is gonna break or start to look funny, et cetera. So if you've achieved those things, you've essentially achieved like the first rung functionality and you can start looking up to productivity. That's where we start going, okay, we can trust that the site functions. How do we do what we wanna do with a little bit less difficulty and time? How do we make it easier and faster to get these things done? That's when we start saying, well, can we make content updating simpler and quicker? Can we be a little bit more granular with our governance? Can we start thinking about who does and doesn't need to have edit access? And can we give them just the type of access they need and nothing else? And we can think about like, are there workflows that can be automated so that our staff is spending less time doing a lot of really repetitive tasks or trying to hold things together, right? We start thinking about, okay, we know it works. How can we make it work better? How can we make it work faster? And if you've achieved that level, that's when you're actually ready to go and start talking about impact, right? That is when your site is driving audience engagement. It is supporting your students and your faculty and it's promoting the school, right? That's how you get up sort of to the, to the top um, of that pyramid. So next slide. So in a second, we're gonna, I'm gonna hand over to John to talk a little bit about some of the concrete things that you need to focus on in order to work yourself up to the hierarchy. But one last point I'm gonna leave you with um, is thinking about getting your leadership on board, right? We've all had the experience of talking to leadership to try and get some time and resources invested in web ops and maybe having them not quite realize the value when it's competing with the money that they need for education, for research, for um, hiring new faculty, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is a, just a really, really normal dilemma that everybody faces. So a few strategies that have worked for, for me and my colleagues in the past, one of the key ones is to get your gatekeepers on board, right? Either these are, the, these are either the primary decision makers 
or they are extremely influential people who, for whatever reason, don't think it's a good use of time and resources um, to invest uh, on, on your website or web operations. But chances are that person or those people have something that they hate about the site that they wish was different. If you can ensure that what you're trying to do builds in a solution to their particular bugaboo with the site, then you've taken someone from being an obstacle to being an ally. And then you're more likely to have them on board with what you need. So that's always been um, a useful strategy. And then, uh, you know, a second approach here is, is, you know, crunch the numbers, right? We all work with uh, educators and scholars. We know how important it is to make evidence-based data-driven decisions when we allocate our budgets, right? There should be no shortage of information that you can provide your leadership about how much time is perhaps being wasted by your staff dealing with a site that is at the bottom of the hierarchy, uh, how much uh, more you could achieve if perhaps your site, if we spend enough time trying to get the site past some of these basic problems and to a place where it could start to, to do some of that impactful work. You know, let the numbers speak for themselves, right? The, the idea is that um, you'll be able to provide a tangible benefit to the institution by investing in this level of infrastructure. And then the third point here is really just more of a tip. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Of course, you have a list of 50 things that you would love for the site to do. Uh, pick one or two that are the most critical and the most crucial and focus on those first, right? Ideally, you'll be able to continue making improvements over time but uh, you need to be able to be realistic because you also need to be able to show success to your leadership, right? If you come to them with uh, an unrealistic wish list and you don't get those things done in the time or the budget that you were allotted, it's a lot less likely that you're going to be given that time and budget again in the future to do more. So really think carefully about what it is that's the most important to achieve uh, and focus on that when it's time to start talking about investing in your, in your web ops. So, with that, uh, I'm gonna turn things over to John to talk a little bit more about what actual progress looks like. Thank you so much, Cheney. Um, loved it, uh, so informative. And, and so if you think back to uh, where, where Cheney kicked us off with and asked you that starting question about what is the one thing that you wish your site could do? Um, I wanna bring us back to that. So even though we're gonna be talking about like that, that hierarchy, the fundamental, way to kind of move up that pyramid, to climb that ladder, uh, to make your site reliable and, and what you want. Uh, it's really important to start with impact. Uh, and the reason for this, maybe at the moment, um, you've got a mess and you're just trying to get it up and running, uh, but having that vision for where you're going is so important. Uh, so we're gonna stop and think for a moment about what the primary goal of the website is. And so this is where, back to that first question about what's the one thing you wish your website could do how does that match up to the primary goal of your website? Um, it's easy to take that idea for granted. Um, you know, I've asked people, well, why does your, why do you have a website? I've gotten answers like, well, uh, you have to have a website or well, we've always had one, but those are wrong answers. That's not the reason to have a website. Uh, this can make some uncomfortable conversations uh, because you may have to challenge people and say, why does this website need to exist? Uh, but they're trusting you. You're the expert here. Uh, and so have these so that the organization can figure that out because you don't wanna just have a website because you feel you need one. It should be serving a purpose. And it's right that um, you need to have a website, but that website needs to be for a specific reason. So find out what does the website do for the group that's gonna be managing it? Is it driving donations? Maybe it connects students and faculty. Maybe it raises awareness for something important. But before you make these changes, you really needed to know what that website's intending to do. And let that be your kind of like guiding North Star for the project. And so when you think about what's the, what's the one thing I wish this website could do, it should very tangibly move you further towards that goal of what is the most important thing about your website. So think about this for a moment. Um, what is that primary goal? Um, if, you, if you have a piece of paper and pen nearby, write it down. Um, maybe you don't, or maybe you've not had a chance to think about this too much. Maybe it doesn't jump to mind. Um, 
take this question and think contemplate it over a cup of tea. But it's really important as you move forward further and you start acting on um, the further items that we're going to talk about, um, that this is always kind of in the back of your mind. Um, and so we represent that here, kind of like this uh, shining, beaming sun up in the in the future, this impact that we want to drive. Now, maybe in the moment, um, we're at a spot where that's not going to happen, um, but we need to make sure we're headed there. And Cheney, she was talking about that pyramid, the importance of that functionality. Um, and I'm, I've called it here credibility, but they're really the same thing. And the reason I'm calling it credibility here, I'm going to tell you a story um, about me. Like I said, I learned from some of the disasters I've had um, where a loss in functionality ended up meaning a loss of credibility for the team. Uh, so about eight years ago, I started work um, at a university. And the first meeting I had outside of my department was about a crisis that had just occurred. You see, two days before I started, what a time to start. Um, they had been testing their emergency alert system. And somebody had pushed the wrong button. And so this alert that said there's an active danger on campus, instead of being channeled to a few people on the testing system was accidentally sent out on the production system. Um, there, the system was set up to, you know, alert every single uh, attached phone across campus. Um, every single desktop computer was connected and a giant banner popped up about an active danger on campus seek shelter. Obviously people were terrified. Uh, it was a horrible situation. Um, my The impact that I had from this was um, as coming on board on the team that managed the university's flagship website, and the emergency website, uh, because this huge amount of traffic generated not just across campus, uh, but caught media attention and ended up making national media. That's the worst way to get media coverage for your for your university um, is for a, a horrible thing like this. Uh, thankfully, there was no danger. Everyone was fine. But all of that traffic meant our infrastructure crumpled. All of our core sites were on the same server and it wasn't ready to handle all of that traffic. And so what people perceived was a warning about a horrible danger on campus. And then every communication outlet across campus uh, seemed to just go dead, silent, and nobody could get information. Uh, Cheney mentioned this earlier about the importance of infrastructure in crisis communication. And we felt this immediately. Um, this was us trying to figure out what was going on. And so we had our meeting and the entire meeting was, how do we make sure this never happens again? Um, because it was terrible. Rumors were spreading. Now, eventually we were able to, to get the information out. Everyone was okay. The website came up. It ended up being a false alert, uh, but we had found out a hole in our system. Now, thankfully, this was in uh, a false emergency, and so we were able to be prepared uh, for when there would be a real emergency by learning from that. Um, so it's important to know, does your team have the tooling you need to regularly develop and test changes to your website? Now, the event I talked about wasn't related to the most recent disaster, but most likely many of you have had similar events, hopefully on a much smaller scale, but, but COVID created so many new strains all throughout kind of that website operations process, uh, whether it was people processes or infrastructure or, or many of the other areas that we rely on, they were strained and some of them didn't make it. And so um, when a site goes down, um, it doesn't really matter who's at fault. In, in, in our situation, um, technically we could have tried to blame it on a different department, but you know, when the chancellor calls your department and says, why is your website down? Trying to pass the blame doesn't work. You say, we're gonna try and figure this out. Uh, and so, uh, as I mentioned, we lost a lot of credibility because of this, because we didn't have that underlying functionality that was needed. Um, and so since then, um, you know, the process coming out of that was learning. How do we rebuild this functionality? How do we build infrastructure and processes in place to make sure this doesn't occur? And so I'm gonna share kind of just four quick bullets here about this. Um, if you're a developer or on the, the more tech side of things, um, 
these may be things that you know how have, have maybe done or you know how to start the process on. Maybe you're on the other side. Uh, you're on the business side or the marketing side of, of handling this. In that case, these are things to make sure you check with your uh, technical team and say, hey, do you have these things in process? Um, I'm going to mention four of them here that are kind of the, the most uh, obvious things that, that are a sign of, hey, this website's fragile. So we're talking, again, that base level of kind of that Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, you want to make sure that you've got some version control. This allows you to make sure that if something messes up, you can revert back to previous versions and allows your developers to collaborate together uh, to get things done. Um, make sure you've got some series of automated backups. Do you have a way to restore things if a disaster occurs? Just fundamentally, you want to make sure you're backing things up um, and can restore that. Do you have multiple environments? Um, you want to make sure that when you make changes, they don't break the live site. I talked about, you know, obviously that the big disaster in our website went down. Our website had also gone down because developers, uh, one of those times, yes, it was me, made a change on a website in production and it worked on my machine, but it didn't work on the production machine and the entire site went down and we had to scramble to fix it. So we ended up with multiple environments. Now I make the change on a test environment and only when it works there do I move it into production. And so make sure you have this so you're not breaking things where people can see it. Um, and then lastly, make sure you've got these, you have your security updates. Um, whatever system you're using, make sure that you're staying on top of this. This is one of the biggest reasons um, that I've had to deal with websites that have been hacked um, is because people have a website, they forget about it, they don't keep on top of these. And the underlying thing, you know, uh, in my case, it was often a WordPress site. WordPress was completely secure, except that they were running a version from four or five years ago and hadn't updated it. If they had, it would never have happened. Um, but because of that, they ended up running into an issue. So make sure you're staying on updates uh, for both your, your core CMS, whatever that is, and then any modules or plugins that might be out there. Uh, now, after this, um, the next step here in the credibility layer, and um, as it related to the infrastructure I ran into, uh, is making sure your infrastructure is really robust. Um, now, there's lots of ways to do that. And so I don't want to be prescriptive and tell you, hey, you have to go use Pantheon uh, to solve this. You can solve it other ways, but make sure that you are solving it. So um, I'll, I'll leave you with this question. Do you have a performance target? And so the idea here is to set a goal and just measure against it. Know what kind of performance is acceptable for you. Um, make sure you've done some load testing or something so that whenever a bunch of people come to the website, you know it's not going to fail. Um, as I mentioned, that crisis that um, the team encountered, we were able to use that to rebuild our infrastructure uh, to something we could be confident in. And so a few years later, whenever our university hosted the presidential debate, we were able to say with confidence, we can handle all of this news coverage because we learned from that crisis where we failed before. And now, whenever this event occurred, it all went incredibly smoothly. We built a ton of our credibility back. People became confident because they saw, hey, this team can handle this large influx because we were finally ready for that. So make sure that you're, you're looking at these things. Um, another area, especially here as we talk about this idea of higher education, um, is to make sure you have accessibility targets. Accessibility matters. Um, it matters because one, you want to be a good per person. Like, have as many people as possible be able to access your content. Uh, but it also matters for legal reasons. In the higher education world, you're going to get sued if you're not doing this. Um, now, it's a, it's a goal, you know, it, it's better to have a plan than to have no plan. So don't let a perfect plan stop you from just getting a plan in pace, place and starting to do this. You can pick your standard. There's a lot of different information out there. Uh, you can pursue lots of different ones, but just pick one and start working towards it. And then as you measure that, you can continue to improve and grow, uh, but make sure you've got something in this area um, around accessibility. The other thing uh, that's super important is going to be, um, can you collaborate across teams? Here we're starting to talk about this next tier. You've got your fundamental um, kind of credibility built. You've built out that functionality. Now let's move on into productivity. And one of the most important things here is 
relationships working together. Um, and so how does your team of marketers, designers, developers, content creators, other stakeholders, all the people that you have working together collaborate on a website? Uh, there's lots of different ways to do this. You see, I was working uh, together with a designer and we were building a new website for the anthropology department. And we had uh, a ton of fun doing this together. We built a beautiful website. If I could toot our own horn a little bit, I built in a lot of really great functionality. I mean, it did everything uh, that they wanted. And then we showed it to them and they seemed happy at first, but within a year, they had abandoned our website and moved on to something that looked way worse, had a lot less functionality. Uh, and that's where I realized that when we talk about collaboration, um, at, at least for me, it's really easy for me to think collaboration me meant me and, and my teammate. Uh, but when you're collaborating and building a website, you're often doing it for someone else. And it's really important that you're meeting their needs. And what had happened, we had started building something that we thought met what they wanted, uh, but it didn't really. I hadn't really listened and sat down to hear what they wanted. I had over-engineered the project. And so you can build something beautiful that is all of these best standards, but if it doesn't match the purpose of the website, the needs of the people using that website, it becomes useless and they're gonna find something that looks way worse, uh, but meets their needs. And so uh, I just want you to learn from my mistake that collaboration is about a shared vision, that you're working together, that you're listening and valuing the input from all the stakeholders there that are gonna be a part of this project. Make sure you're aligned and you're building a website that somebody wants instead of one that nobody needs. Uh, another piece of this is to look at uh, your community here. Um, as we look at this, what is the quantity and quality of the partnerships that you have? Uh, think about, I, I mean, in the higher education world, it is so important that you're developing these relationships with people across campus because you don't want to end up being an island kind of isolated. So either find a community or start one, uh, but build a community of people with similar goals that are going to work together to just improve the space um, at your university. Uh, the other piece of the uh, productivity layer we like to talk about is around automation. Um, and here, you're really wanting to improve um, th the time that you're spending on projects and making sure it's towards things that are going to drive business value. So automate any mundane or error-prone tasks at this point. Uh, maybe it, there's all kinds of things you can do on a technical side with um, visual regression testing, maybe you're automating a bunch of your configuration. There's, there's a lot of technical options here um, that you can find out what works for you. Uh, but just start looking at this because the real goal here you want is to begin to move as much time away from your designers, your developers, your content people from doing tasks that are just mundane, just busy work and into that top part of the pyramid into driving impact because this is where we want to be focused. And so uh, hopefully now uh, your team, as you've moved up, can really begin to focus on this area. And so we talked about, you know, what is the most, of, what's the primary goal of our website? Now we want to make sure that we are aligning on that, that we're all focused on the same thing. Uh, and we want to start measuring that. How do we know that we're meeting that primary goal? And so, you know, Use what you have. If, if you've not done this before, throw on some Google Analytics. Um, maybe you run campaigns and have Google Tag Manager. That's awesome. Uh, or maybe you, you, know, you keep leveling up. Maybe you have a whole MarTech stack that you use that integrates in and you track things across tons of websites. Wherever you are, make sure you're at least measuring at some point. You can always grow that process, but make sure you're doing this. That way, so it does two things. One, it allows you to see what you're doing and help you know when you make changes, um, whether they're improving the website or not. But second, back to that piece Cheney kind of ended on, is it allows you to now have that data that you want to be able to go to your leadership and say, hey, we're making a difference. We're doing something here. And that gives you the ability to have a seat at the table and to start getting the resources you may want to do even more with the website. Uh, but it really comes out of being able to prove the value of the work that's happening. And then here, um, 
the kind of last key thing is to iterate. You really have to make sure that this isn't a one-time step through the pyramid. Um, you can keep going deeper and deeper. You can keep improving that website. It's really easy to get stuck uh, in like an endless cycle of redesigns, but that means that the website's never growing. It just, every time it stops, and then you just restart all over again. Learn from what you've done and try to iterate on that so that you can keep improving it and gaining extra value, uh, whether that's A-B testing or, or you're doing maybe user testing to try and figure out how to best do this. Um, in fact, it's so important, iterate twice. We've got it on here twice because it's a place of learning. You should know, you probably know this inherently, but never stop learning. Um, Always keep learning as you're doing this. Keep iterating over this to constantly improve and build something better. So to sum this up, let's remember to start by understanding that primary goal of your website. Let that be kind of your North Star. And then begin, look at the hierarchy, begin to work your way up. Start with that core functionality that you need. Uh, make sure your website isn't fragile by enacting best practices and standards. Uh, next, you can increase productivity by building deep partnerships with people um, both on campus and with the, the teams that you work with outside of campus. Um, and then begin to automate any mundane or error prone tasks that you can. And all of that's really to be able to reach the top here where you begin to have a strong impact. Uh, and you wanna demonstrate that by, by measuring your goals um, and then iterating quickly to be able to constantly meet that. So that kind of brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, if you've got questions about this, we would love to hear from you. Um, you can reach out to Cheney or I on Face or on, uh, sorry, Twitter, or you can reach out on LinkedIn. We would love to answer questions you might have. Um, Cheney, anything you would like to add here at the end? No, I think you've, you've summed it up quite well. So yeah, there are a lot of great steps here that will take you wherever you are in your site's evolution uh, to the next step. And uh, hopefully we've provided some tools that will help you not only uh, determine where you where you want to be, um, but help you sort of bring your your team and your leadership along to get you there. So best of luck. We'll be delighted to hear from you uh, with any any questions or comments that you have. Uh, and thanks so much for watching. Thank you.